Welcome back to the program. I'm James Morrow, and let's head overseas to Ukraine now, where the Biden administration is set to send dozens of Abrams tanks to the war-torn East. As reluctant as of a decision as that may have been, Germany has also changed its stance on the deployment of Leopard 2 tanks from Poland to Ukraine. Now, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is asking for more Western fighter jets as Russian troops look to take new territory. Now, before we dissect all this, here's the latest on the situation. The town of Volidar in the Donbas region has remained a focal point of fighting over the past several weeks. New drone video shows the true scale of destruction with widespread damage from artillery battles. The town sits to the southwest of the city of Donetsk and had a population of more than 14,000 people before the war began. Further north, Russian troops are reportedly making progress around the city of Bakhmut, threatening to encircle the Ukrainian stronghold by cutting off their main supply line. Three civilians were killed in the Donbas region due to a Russian missile attack as others were injured. Overnight, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky described the situation in the east. The occupiers are not just storming our positions. They are deliberately and methodically destroying these towns and villages around them with artillery, airstrikes, missiles. The Russian army has no shortage of lethal means and can only be stopped by force. Analysts believe Russia is preparing for more extensive ground operations in the coming weeks, possibly to get ahead of the delivery of Western tanks. Ukraine's ambassador to France said that a total of 321 tanks have been promised to Ukraine, including the German-made Leopard 2s and the U.S.-made M1 Abrams. Ukraine is now asking for Western fighter jets, specifically the F-16. According to a spokesperson for the Ukrainian Air Force, the country would like to have at least 24 new jets by the end of the year. To dissect all this, let's bring in Strategic Analysis Australia's director, Michael Shoebridge. Michael, thanks so much for coming on the program this evening. And I've got to say, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on this because we've got calls for tanks, we've got calls for fighter jets, long-range missiles. How much of this is going to help actually end the conflict and how much of this risks uh, actually escalating it to new and dangerous levels? Well, James, it's, it is a balance, but I think the major question has to be what do the Ukrainians need to have battlefield success? because the Russians are now showing they'll just throw numbers at the problem. They don't care that they've got badly trained, badly equipped soldiers. They'll just throw them into the meat grinder. So jets, tanks, longer range missiles are all good. The bigger issue, though, is NATO cannot take months to make decisions on individual weapon systems like it did with the tanks, because the Ukrainians, the military needs to be comprehensively re-equipped over this year because they're going to run out of all the spares and parts they need to support their Russian equipment. But, Michael, I mean, just as a bit of a student of history, that scenario you describe where Russia just keeps throwing more and more cannon fodder at the problem, um, Western nations have run up against this before and with, I have to say, limited success. What does the end game look like here? And is there a realistic po po um, possibility that Ukraine can take back territory uh, and then end this as a whole and sovereign nation like it was before? Or does Russia just keep dialing up the conflict even further? Well, I think the Ukrainians showed last year that they can succeed on the battlefield. They can mobilise numbers of troops, and if they're better trained and equipped, they succeed. So the answer is, if the Ukrainians keep winning on the battlefield, then the war ends to their advantage. That's regardless of what Putin might want to do, unless he wants to risk nuclear war. Right. And I mean, we've also seen uh, our Australian troops. Uh, they're providing training for Ukrainian armed forces. They're currently in southern England and learning some of the tough conditions that the Ukrainians are going to be working under. But while some of these Ukrainians have had military training, others are mere civilians. And Lieutenant General Simon Stewart scouted the British training facilities last year. It is inspiring to hear what he had to say about some of these men. I met a pastry chef a taxi driver and a hairdresser. The thing that was common to that very diverse group was their commitment, their courage, their focus and their stoicism. 
very inspiring. Do you think that's enough? Well, we tell ourselves, you know, to be a, an effective military, you've got to be a professional soldier for years and years. The Ukrainians are showing with courage and intelligence and the right equipment and training, they can be really effective. I think the Australian soldiers can learn as much from the Ukrainians, but really we have to help the Ukrainians mobilise better than the Russians. And the Russians, fortunately, are doing a terrible job. Yeah, it's been pretty shocking, I think, seeing how um, how poorly the vaunted Soviet, or not Soviet, Russian military, forgive me, uh, has been in actually deploying itself. But I want to bring things closer to home, Michael. In Australia, the news has come through is going to increase presence in the Pacific with a new $65 million high commission in the Solomon Islands. And you recall that was a huge issue during uh, the election last year and a $120 million logistics hub. Now, the island nation, of course, has become a key strategic point in the region. Um, but is this enough to compete with China's growing influence in the Solomons and in the Pacific more broadly? Well, James, in one way, spending this money for these Australian buildings shows long-term commitment. That's good. In another way, it's pretty bad to look like we're, uh, we are rewarding Prime Minister Sogavari of the Solomons, who's done nothing but act against the region and Australia's interests cozying up to China. Uh, we really need to get beyond uh, spending money on our own buildings and with the two-trick pony of security and aid. Aid is not helping these poor South Pacific economies. Indeed, indeed. Finally, I just want to ask one more quick question. We talk about China influence in the Pacific, and we've got this also this news that China is forcing its students to come back to Australia after they've announced that it's a, they're ending recognition of online overseas studies, saying that all students must return to their campuses, even if they're here in Australia. What is behind the logic of this? I can't quite puzzle it out, Michael. Well, to me, it's a reminder that the Chinese government makes sudden arbitrary decisions that intervene in markets. So our universities, I know, are welcoming this because they see rivers of gold, but they should think to themselves, this kind of arbitrary market intervention is all bad news. There is no way our university sector should return to the lazy all-in bet they made on the China market before COVID. Bingo. <laughs> That's absolutely correct. And yet, have they learned anything? I'm not so sure. Michael Shoebridge, thank you so much for your time.